Welcome, Welcome to your online coffee break, where we discuss bite-sized topics that inspire, educate, and entertain. Here's your host, a software innovator, award-winning marketer, and astronomy and space buff, Chuck Fields. Hello, thanks for joining me today for your online coffee break. Today, I'd like to welcome my special guest, James Fell. James is a motivation, health, and fitness writer for the Los Angeles Times and the Chicago Tribune. He is the head fitness writer at AskMen.com and has authored pieces in Time Magazine, The Guardian, Men's Health, Women's Health, and many other publications. He has a massive and highly engaged following on Facebook and Twitter, and his blog, BodyForWife.com, has millions of visitors a year. He is also the author of Lose It Right. James joined me today to discuss how lasting change can happen in an instant, which he features in his newest book. Online Coffee Break. James, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on the show, Chuck. Now, my pleasure. Now, you're a fantastic writer, and you're also a highly regarded science-based motivator. I love that term. Tell me a little bit more about how you got into that field. Uh, well, I, in a previous life, I was a businessman. I had an MBA and I worked in, uh, worked as a marketing executive, but what, you know, that, that was something that, that I, I didn't hate it, but I didn't love it. And, uh, and I decided, you know, it's time to chase my real passion in life, which is writing. And at the age of 40, I decided to go through a career transition. I wasn't good enough to be a novelist, but uh, it's one of those situations where in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Yep. And health and fitness writers, well, at least 10 years ago, I wasn't really impressed with what was out there. <laughs> so I, I thought, you know what, I could, I think I can do this better than some other people are doing. And, uh, and so I started writing about health and fitness because it was something I was very passionate about. Mm-hmm. I'd lost a lot of weight myself and I'd, I'd done it through a lot of scientific analysis. And uh, within a year, I had a column at the Los Angeles Times, despite being Canadian and living in Canada. There's no shortage of fitness experts in LA, but right. they gave me a shot. Oh, that's fantastic. See, I love it. And it kind of led you to your site. Your blog is called Body for Wife. Dot com. That's W-I-F-E. Yes. Tell me how that came about. So that was um, a joke among friends from when the book Body for Life was immensely popular right around 2001 or 2002. Mm -hmm. I had some friends that were doing the program and we used to go and work out at lunch today, uh, at lunch every day together. And uh, and I was bigger than they were. I was was in better shape than they were. (laughs) And somebody just made a a comment on it. It's like, man, what's your secret? And I just joked, I'm on the Body for Wife program. And they laughed. And but, you know, there was some truth, a little bit of truth to it, because uh, when I was 25 years old, I wanted to propose to my then girlfriend Mm -hmm. and I had gotten quite heavy. And I thought, like, just as an impetus to change, I'll get in shape before I proposed. And I mean, it it really it's not to be taken literally. It's a it's a tongue in cheek thing. But, you know, I'd be lying if I said she didn't appreciate the efforts. Of course. (laughs) Now, speaking of appreciating efforts, today is a very exciting day for you. You've just released your latest book, How Lasting Change Can Happen in an Instant. Can you just give a brief synopsis to our audience about the book? So the book is The Science of the Life-Changing Epiphany. Mm -hmm. And so it's uh, it's about someone that has a massive transformative experience that deeply motivates them to go on a new path in life. And to back up just a little bit, so I started off in health and fitness, Mm -hmm. but I always focused on motivational stuff. I wasn't talking about squat technique or, you know, macronutrient ratios very much. I was more interested in how do you get off the couch or how do you make yourself eat properly? Mm -hmm. And so motivational writing, motivation permeated my writing for years prior to that. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that there were a lot of people that had lost massive amounts of weight and kept it off, which is a pretty rare thing. And these weren't people that did that tortoise knot hair approach. They did not do slow and steady baby steps to change. They were suddenly overwhelmingly inspired to do it because of this holy shit moment that changed their life. And so I started investigating it. It was, geez, 
almost four years ago now. Wow. And I recalled that I had one of these that totally changed my life in my 20s. I've had a couple more since then. And I was fascinated at how much scientific academic research was in it. I mean, not tons, but there was definitely some that had been looked at mm -hmm. that it's, it's a different concept of change. It's more enigmatic than your more traditional models of behavior change, because we're looking at identity and value change as opposed to our external behaviors. Mm -hmm. But it was, and there were so many powerful stories right after I got the idea for this book, I posted it on my Facebook page asking people, have you had one of these? The comments field exploded. And wow. there were so many people yeah. that it had these powerful transformative experiences that, yeah, some of them have to do with weight loss. That's a good example. Mm -hmm. But they run the gamut. Career, relationships, battling addiction is a really big one. People that just decided they're done. Mm -hmm. Um, mood state, uh, going back to school, it, it's just, uh, uh, people that decided I'm going to change the world and they did. <laughs> you know, it's See, just I, fascinating. I, I love that. And, and one of the examples you give, I, I guess I identified with it because his name happened to be Chuck, like mine. And, um, yes. I was distraught when I first read the first, first thing, I don't want to give anything away, but I like how he basically said, Oh my gosh, I'm going to become a dad. I've got to make this change right now. And when I look back at my life too, I, I have those epiphanies over time. And it is, it's about this, this epiphany, this major life decision to make a change and it's a lasting change. And that's what I think is so funny because this being January, a lot of people make their new year's resolutions and I always laugh each year because I've been in health and fitness too. And I laugh because you know, you're the gym and it's really packed in January, February, a little bit less March. A lot less and it goes on why do you think so many people make their resolutions and don't get it they're not making that lasting change well a report just came out that by the end of this month 80 percent of people will have given up on their new year's resolution and you use the word decision it's actually a life-changing epiphany is more of an awakening it's a transformation suddenly unleashed the New Year's resolution is more of a decision to alter your behaviors. And it's like that movie Shrek, where he says, yep. ogres are like onions. Well, people are like onions too. If you cut them, they're gonna cry. But uh, but the, that's not what I mean. <laughs> that, that we, we have layers to our personality. It's called Rokic's uh, model of personality. And the external layer are our behaviors, our actions. And then you go down, you've got beliefs and then attitudes and then values and identity. Uh, a transformative life-changing epiphany is something that has a profound effect on your identity and your values. Whereas when people do the, um, do the New Year's resolution approach, they're looking just at those surface level behaviors. They say, I'm going to go to the gym, I'm going to eat better, or I'm going to be kinder or whatever. Mm -hmm. They're not looking at who the person is that does that. They're just looking strictly focused on the action. And what they do is they create a struggle between the internal values and identity and the external behavior. That's why baby steps have been preached for so long, because you want to minimize the pain, minimize the suffering of behavior change so you can slowly drag yourself over a motivational tipping point and create habits that hopefully eventually become sticky. But the failure rate is massive for this. Conversely, when you go through a life-changing epiphany, you change at a core level, mm -hmm. which is what happened with Chuck. So Chuck found out that he was going to be a dad, and he described it as like being struck by lightning. That was an identity change. He suddenly had the mantle of father thrust upon him. That's a new identity. Mm -hmm. And his values came in line with, I want to be a fit and healthy dad for my child. Mm -hmm. So those two things changed in an instant. So these are, that's the thing about behaviors change slowly, values and identity can change like that. And they usually do because it's such a massive change that it, it can't happen slowly. It's something very instantly transformative. So, and it's such a powerful, emotional, neurochemically rewarding experience that you, you understand something really important happened. And here's a direct quote from Chuck where he said, I didn't need to struggle with my motivation. It came built in. And that's nice. the reason right there why I wrote yes. the book. Because what happens is when you change at that core level, everything else syncs up and comes into line. Your behaviors come to line up with this. It would be, it would be challenging to not do it. 
at that point because you're compelled to follow this new path. That is such a good point. And, and one thing that I want to point out to that I love about your book, in addition to your great wit and everything else, is that you give these wonderful exercises for people to do. And, and one of my personal favorites um, for me is, is uh, giving like 10 minutes in the morning and being still, being silent, being quiet and listening uh, for that epiphany to come. Can you share an example of one of those exercises with our audience that they can do right now? Uh, go for a walk and leave your phone at home. <laughs> That's a big one. Love it. So there's great thinkers across the eons that have extolled the virtues of the walk in nature. And they weren't listening, you know, no offense, but they weren't listening to a podcast while they were doing right. it. <laughs> so, so we have a tendency to want constant distraction. And we seem to be afraid to be alone with our thoughts. So the, the way that these life-changing epiphanies work uh, at a very big picture level is to spend time on personal analysis. Now, that's a constricted thinking state. So you're, you're spending time where you're looking at, okay, what are the problems in my life that may, you know, crystallize together so that I reach a little bit of a, you know, I've had enough for even a breaking point? Mm -hmm. um, or, or what is it that I, what do I want to be when I grow up? What are some changes that I'd like to make? And just spend some time analyzing it. And you work at that until you get stuck. But when you're, so you, you think of it as like a problem to be solved. But here's the thing, the answer to the problem doesn't come while you're actively trying to solve it. Right. Because these epiphanies are not consciously generated, they're unconsciously generated. And so it's the, the, the fast, uh, system one, fast thinking versus system two, slow thinking. So you, you work until you get stuck. And then you need to engage in some form of distraction. And a great one is, like I said, going for a walk with no technological uh, distractions, like you're not checking for text messages or Facebook updates or listening to a podcast. Music is OK, um, especially if it's, you know, like me, the same classic rock tunes you've heard a thousand That's times. That's a great transition, though, because one thing I was going to tell you about is one of the wonderful examples the, that we're supposed to do the exercises is the Who song. <laughs> 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 won't get fooled again tell us yeah. about how that song inspires you so the uh i use it as an example in chapter two uh that roger daltrey who um i saw them play a few years ago for their 50th anniversary nice. still got it still has Great. an amazing voice and the song they closed with was won't get fooled again and i give examples of how the sense of rightness that comes with the life-changing epiphany and i said but there's you know there's there's moderate size epiphanies and there's gigantic ones mm -hmm. and the the analogy that i used was about four and a half minutes in roger lets you loose with a yeah that is pretty big that's your your moderate size epiphany and then later on at like you know the seven and a half minute mark there's that famous one that he did on the simpsons <laughs> that <laughs> that everyone knows about that builds up you know you've got the organ playing and the drumming and you can just feel it building and you're waiting for it and then it's just an explosive yeah that i mean i can't sing i can't impersonate it <laughs> that was <But> pretty good <laughs> that that's what it feels like in your brain and the another thing i said is that this new boss of your life is nothing like the old boss, which, as you know, is another quote from the song, mm -hmm. um, although I, I switched it <laughs> because it's not the same as the old boss because it's taking you in a new direction. But, yeah, they come when you're in a distracted state. Shower thoughts are another great example. Mm -hmm. Many a life changing epiphany has happened in the shower. Sometimes they happen right upon waking. So when you wake up in the morning, you're still kind of drowsy. That means you're in a broadened thinking state because you're not you're not hyper focused on anything. Your mind is sort of all over the place. Mm -hmm. So when you wake up in the morning, don't automatically reach for your phone. Like I don't take my phone into my bedroom. And, and I think that there's a good reason for that, mm -hmm. that when the alarm goes off, I, I kind of lie there or sorry if this is TMI, I like to snuggle with my wife for a while. Uh, but I don't, I don't, um, you know, use technological distraction. I just sort of lie there and just sort of slowly allow myself to wake up and, and take a few minutes before I need to leap out of bed. And that is another time when these, when these sudden life changing epiphanies can just pop into awareness while you're not actively trying to solve that problem. See, I love that. And 
I, I do love all these uh, exercises that you're sharing with us. I really do appreciate that. Um, what would you say out there? there? There's people listening, people watching right now. What's that one thing you would say to them to encourage them to reach for your book and to try to reach that epiphany stage? Well, the first that really the most important thing is to believe that it can happen because a lot of people just it doesn't even register as a possibility. We think about, OK, well, I need to change this and I need to change that. Mm -hmm. And they they have a tendency to rationalize everything. We're told not to make emotional based decisions. Mm -hmm. That's actually bad advice. <laughs> we should. Our brains are kind of messy. They're not supercomputers that can analyze every bit of data. Rather, we make decisions based on the emotional value of the information that we're considering mm -hmm. and something that feels right. So we need to tap into our deepest emotional selves and do something that has an overwhelming sense of rightness. And one of the things that's in the book in chapter four about the neuroscience of epiphany mm -hmm is that when people have the answer to a question suddenly pop in out of nowhere, uh, first off, they know the answer is right. And second of off, they are right, as opposed to the people that did the methodical rational analysis. They're less certain of the answer, and there's good reason for that because they're less likely to be correct. So we need to engage our emotional side of our brains in this type of decision making because this is not a rational process it's a deeply emotional that's why it transforms you because your passion has been awakened it's not like a well this is logical i have to do that that right. doesn't inspire people to change it's like i feel that i must do this i am suddenly passionately inspired to do it so that you have to believe that that's something that can happen for you because it does a lot all the time. One of the people I interviewed for the book uh, is Professor William Miller, who was the co-creator of the very popular behavior change theory called motivational interviewing. Mm -hmm. So he was one of the first people to really investigate academically this phenomenon. And he said about a third of people are having one. And that's accidentally happening one with this book. I originally didn't think it would be a how to. But the more I investigated, the more I realized holy cow, we can make this into a how-to book. Right. And uh, and so by following the steps in the book, and there's a lot of them, it's a constant mm -hmm. you know, thread of try this, try this, try this from beginning to end that you know, I think we could boost the possibility of you having one to maybe 50% or better. And even if you don't have one, the way that the exercises in the book are set up is you're still going to be better off. You know, it's, right. it's not a total waste of time yeah. if if you didn't have it. And, you know, hopefully at the very least you were amused because I did try to make it funny. Oh, <laughs> so. and it, it is so funny and it's just worth it because your life can change and you want that lasting change, which you give plenty of examples for the book. James, I wish you the best of luck with your book. I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. Join us today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chuck. It's been a pleasure online coffee break. Wow, I really enjoyed my conversation with James today. It is amazing how lasting change can happen in an instant. If you'd like to find more about James or to order his book, just go to his website, bodyforwife.com. That's B-O-D-Y-F-O-R-W-I-F-E.com. I want to thank James for joining us today. I want to thank you for joining us as well. If you'd like to comment on today's topic, just go to our website, onlinecoffeebreak.com, or give us a call at 317-862-4700. We'd also love it if you'd follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Online Coffee Break. Also, we'd love it if you'd share this episode or rate us on your favorite podcast application. Thanks so much for joining us today. See you next time. God bless.